We are always excited to hear from you folks, knowing that some of your uh, situations may be different, but we welcome all of you here. And we know that most of our uh, attendees come from public libraries, but excited to see some academic folks here, as well as school folks, folks from state libraries, special libraries, consortiums, and many that represent other organizations, nonprofit organizations in their community. So we're really excited to have you here today. I also wanted to be sure that folks know there are a number of resources that have been collected, uh, especially for uh, this session today. Uh, there is a learner guide that is available for everyone to, um, to use either in conjunction with the series, um, work between the series. This is a tool for you to learn together with your colleagues, your volunteers, some action steps for you to take. There's also a social media starter kit that TechSoup has created that we encourage folks to explore as another uh, set of tools to take your learning further. And also uh, there is a worksheet that Jessica has created specific to today's, uh, some of the activities that she recommends in terms of exploring your uh, social media presence on Facebook. So all of those resources are available on the event page and I'm gonna actually put that link in here fresh so that you can see um, that's the one-stop shop for all the resources. We will be adding all of the resources that you all bring to the conversation as well to uh, that resource page, so no need to take vigorous notes. We'll be sharing those with you on that page. We also, in conjunction with this series, have created a survey that we've been using to collect your experiences with social media. There is a survey uh, the survey will remain live actually through December 19th. And Molly actually has done an excellent job of providing a snapshot of the, um, and I'll put that link in there as well, lots of links to share today um, for you to take a peek at where we are so far with the series, with the surveys. But there were 311 respondents when we kind of took that first um, collection of uh, the survey respondents. There are 400 respondents as of today, and we look forward to collecting even more data that we will put into a report at the beginning of the year. So no, this is another way for you to participate in the series. And this is just a snapshot of one of the questions, and we're hoping to uh, tap, tap into some of these examples of how you in libraries are using social media. So uh, know that we'll be continuing to collect your responses there, but this has provided us with some excellent information to create the session today. So I also wanted to just give a little nod to our Web Junction social media. Uh, we uh, follow your social media presence on Facebook in libraries. We actually have been doing it for 94, I just published today's edition, 94 volumes, which uh, cover a number of different, uh, actually over 400 libraries are featured in this social library series. And I just wanted to point it out because it's a really great way for you to see how libraries are using Facebook. We actually have a spreadsheet that we update each week that sorts the ways, the sort of the topics around each of the social library examples. So if you're looking for instance for programming inspiration, you can go to that spreadsheet, look and sort by the different programming efforts and it's an easy, easy way to get inspired by your colleagues in the library field. I also wanted to point out that uh, Web Junction uh, hosts the Geek the Library page on uh, Facebook and we have a number of folks, both within libraries and library supporters that are uh, have liked and follow this page. And as we talk about content generators, folks that you can, uh, on Facebook, libraries that you can get inspired by, I know that Jessica is gonna be talking a lot about content generators. We'd love to see you uh, use that content from Keith the Library on Facebook. 
All right, we are ready to begin our presenters today. I'm really excited that Amy Hitchner is here today with us. She comes to us from the Colorado State Library as the Collaborative Programming Coordinator. And also Jessica Bacon, who is the executive editor and founder of the Five Minute Librarian, a wonderful, wonderful resource for libraries to follow. And we'll get that link in chat as well. And I'm so pleased to have uh, Amy kick us off today. Welcome, Amy. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, glad I got my technical issues fixed, hopefully, and I'm back up and running. Um, so I want to um, I want to welcome everyone here today. I'm honored to be here with you. Um, uh, like Jessica said, I'm the Collaborative Programming Coordinator at the Colorado State Library. And since November of 2016, I have been um, coordinating the State Library social media. So like many of you here, I am also a learner. And um, so I'm, you know, I'm not, I wasn't born and bred a, a social media marketer by any, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm learning along with everyone. And um, today I wanna present a high level overview of how to get set up and running with social media if you are in fact the, um, the person at your library or maybe you're on the team at your library um, that's just getting started. So uh, as we go along, um, many of the resources and tools that I mentioned are linked on the final slide, which are also on the event page um, for today's event. So as we go along here, a couple of objectives, objectives to keep in mind. What we're going to be doing is learning how to make a basic social media plan to maximize your limited uh, resources and staff time. I realize that many of you here are um, from small or rural libraries, which hold a special place in my heart. Um, in Colorado, we have pockets of these libraries around the state and the energy is fantastic. I just love going out there. Um, so these are some ideas if you are on a limited staff time and budget to just get you up and running. We're gonna talk about some resources that are useful to uh, first time social media managers and or content creators. And then at the very end, we're gonna learn some very basic high level graphic design principles that you can use when you are creating content because image based content is very important in social media. Okay, so what is social media? Um, in my mind, it is the digital space where you interact with your community. And it's really a modern day expectation that businesses, that organizations um, have a social media presence. Um, and it's different from other marketing tools in that it's not just for pushing information, it's not just me telling you about the things going on in the library, but it's also for an engagement with your community. And that's really the key part of social media is that you are trying to reach your community members in a meaningful way so that they engage with your posts so that they feel connected to your organization. Your patrons can really be your best advocates online. So if you put something out there on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and your patrons pick it up and retweet it share it, like it, whatever it is, they are becoming um, your, your mouthpiece and there's legitimacy to that. So you really wanna um, encourage those kind of interactions. Um, social media is also a great space to reinforce the partnerships that you have with other organizations. So for instance, the Colorado State Library has partnerships with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and another organization called Get Outdoors Colorado. And through our work together, we often tag team off of each other's social media by liking and retweeting and all those you know, fun social media type interactions. Um, so you can also um, show the world what partnerships you have and also collaborate um, in that space as well. So one of the first things that I think a lot of uh, folks, the, the big barrier that comes down is I don't know how to do this. Um, I, I'm not a social media manager, I'm not a marketer, um, I don't, I, I'm a librarian, like I was never trained to do this. Um, but my answer, especially when, it's when we're talking about um, those things are just a little bit outside of our comfort zone or a little bit outside of what we were trained to do is, well, it's a good thing that we're librarians and that our superpower is learning. 
we can learn all kinds of things that can help us, and this is really no exception. Um, so if you are in a situation where your library wants to get started with social media, um, my, um, my, my big, my big uh, message to you is you can just jump in and start. You don't need to be an expert. Um, you don't need to have a budget. You don't need to have a history of doing this. Um, what you do need, though, is to go and find where the energy is in your organization. You need to find out who is really excited to be a megaphone for your library. And regardless of that person's title or position, you need to harness that energy um, because that person is going to be always looking for uh, ways to make your library presence on social media more engaging and more interactive. So um, that's almost exactly what happened in my situation. We had um, an employee that left the state library she was managing social media accounts, and when that, that sort of um, role became available, um, I said, I would love to do it. I would love to tell the world the amazing things that are happening at the Colorado State Library, and I would love to help tell the world about the incredible things happening in the state of Colorado. So um, I took that on, and I gathered a team together. So that would be my number one piece of advice, is to don't let the um, I don't know how stop you. You just need to find where the energy is at, and eventually the expertise will come. Also, leverage some of your community. So if you have a teen group, if you have a digital photography group, if you have folks who are coming into your library regularly that are excited, find ways to, to harness that resource. Those people can also um, help you in this endeavor. Oops, sorry, click this guy up here. OK. So let's talk about an overarching social media plan. Um, we're going to go into each of these in a little bit more detail. But when you talk about creating a social media plan, you're going to have a couple of different elements. You're going to have your team. Um, it could be just you, although I discourage, I discourage it just being one person um, for reasons I'll go into in just a moment. But you want to assemble your team. You want to define some goals, determine what your budget is, plan to plan, so make sure you get those meetings on the books. Um, you're going to gather your content and to schedule it regularly. And you want to make sure that you are feeding and watering your social media. And we'll talk about what that is going to look like. And then finally, you want to make sure that you're sort of completing the loop by going back and looking at your analytics, making sure that um, the efforts that you're making are, are actually producing something. And if they're not, can you change tactics a little bit? So that's your overarching plan. And this might look a lot like other plans that you make for other parts of your library life, and that's because social media really shouldn't be something that's outside of what you normally do. It should be something um, that you incorporate into other planning along with your marketing and your programs and your events and your outreach and all that stuff. So it shouldn't look too scary or different from what you've encountered before. Okay, so assembling your team. Again, I encourage you to um, go where your energy is, Expertise can be learned, but motivation is very hard to conjure from thin air. So find who those people are that are excited about your library and what it's doing, um, that, that want to tell the world and that want to engage more people in an online space. Um, when you are assembling your team, you want to make sure that you're agreeing on your roles and expectations. This is like a project management tip. Um, if if the folks on your team don't really understand what their role in that team is, things can get a little messy. So in our team, we have folks from different uh, areas of the State Library that meet once a month, and they are sort of like my content people. So they come and we all have a roundtable discussion, and we talk about things that are going on in their teams or in the State Library in general. Do they need to be on social media? What's the timeline? Um, and then we just start building our content from there. So those are my content creators. And then I'm more of the um, planning it and getting, you know, where the rubber hits the road, getting it actually out onto the channels and monitoring the channels. But if I didn't have that amazing team of folks who came every month and helped me build that content, I wouldn't know everything that's going on and all the different um, facets of the State Library that I need to be talking about. Those folks also bring news from other areas of Colorado that they may have been working in to say, hey, did you know that a library down in Durango or up in Greeley is doing something awesome? And we work that in as well. 
So make sure you assemble your team and make sure that you agree on roles and expectations. This is also very important when you're setting up your account access. So each social media channel does something a little bit, uh, has a different way of managing different roles. Um, it might be like an administrator and then an editor and then a, a, a contributor or something like that. So um, you need to make sure that you understand who has which role when you're setting up those accounts. And to, to document that so that, you know, if you win the lottery and you leave tomorrow, someone has um, something written down of, of who all these people are and what their relationship is to those accounts. Okay, so defining your goals. Uh, to avoid a just because syndrome, so we want to be on Twitter just because, that's just what we do. Um, you want to avoid that. Um, you want to choose things that are more strategic, that are tied to your goals, um, that align with any overarching marketing goals that your organization might have. Um, you, could, you should also take into consideration your, um, your intended audience when you create your goals. Um, who are you trying to reach? Is there a specific um, age range? Um, any, any of those sort of things, um, and it can be as specific or as broad as you want to be, but I do encourage you to, to define your goals. Otherwise, every new shiny, wonderful thing that comes along, you're going to try and do it. Um, rather than saying, you know what, no, we're going to try this for a little while and we're going to look at our analytics and then we're going to go from there. So be, be a little more strategic about it. Um, our goals at the State Library um, are to educate, excite, and engage. Um, and our, our specific target audience um, isn't the general public, it is other librarians in Colorado. Because of the nature of our organization, we are a support agency, um, we are state level, and so our primary audience are other librarians and not necessarily the general public. But depending on what type of organization you're from, that could be, you know, it could be different. So again, it's a good conversation to have with your team, um, with your own manager, um, and just with your organization in general, is what are we trying to do and who are we trying to reach with social media? Okay, so this is a, a reason, uh, this is an example of how, <laughs> what not to do <laughs> with your goals. Um, your goal shouldn't be to just use all the social media platforms. Um, there's so many, I wanna do them all. I wanna have the biggest reach. I wanna be on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and all the things. Um, that's a really terrible idea for a couple of reasons. You're gonna spread yourself really thin for one thing. And I'm assuming that if we're talking small budgets, small staff time, you just really don't have, um, you don't have the resources to spread yourself over that many uh, platforms. Also, you're gonna find that certain platforms reach certain audiences differently. Um, and, and so, you know, your time spent on Pinterest might not uh, be the best idea, but maybe Instagram works better. Some of that is just trial and error. Um, uh, but I, I encourage you to maybe start small, maybe pick two that seem like the best fit and study your analytics and then go from there. So for instance, um, the State Library is on Facebook and we're also on Twitter. Um, Facebook is of course, you know, it's ubiquitous. Everybody's on Facebook, it seems like. So that's gonna be sort of our big bang for our buck. Twitter is a little bit more of an experiment. It's more of a news feed look and feel. Um, we're noticing that numbers, you know, across Twitter in general are starting to decline a little bit. So maybe we might look at trying something else in the future. Maybe we might look at Instagram um, because it's more photo based and it's very quickly, you know, it's growing very quickly. Um, it's, you just hear a lot more buzz about it. But we started small with two and we're gonna grow from there and see if we need to cut out any as we go along. And as far as choosing platforms, I would say that while each has its strengths and its weaknesses, um, there's no one size fits all. We find that in different parts of the state, what one platform, you know, one platform might be reaching a specific target group very well. You cross this to the other side of the state and it doesn't do well. Um, Pinterest might do well in Jefferson County and not well in La Plata County. Um, but that's really the experiment part of it and why I encourage you to look at your analytics as you keep going. Okay. So another part of the plan that you're gonna to put together is your budget. Now, you could have a budget of zero dollars. 
And I will tell you that our budget at the State Library for social media right now is zero dollars. We're making it work, we're making it happen, um, and you can get it done. With a few extra dollars, however, you could do a few extra things. Um, you could buy a subscription to iStock or some other stock photo website and get some nicer um, stock photo images that you could use when you're creating your graphics. Um, you could also pay for Facebook advertising, which is actually not as expensive as you might think. Um, sometimes it's $3 to $5 a day to boost certain posts up. Um, and I have heard from other libraries in our state that are doing that, that it works very, very well. So, you know, if you had just a little bit of a budget, you could pay for some Facebook advertising. Another way, if you had a little bit of extra money, is you could upgrade to the pro subscription of some design tools that you might use, like um, Canva is a fantastic design tool. Um, it's a, like graphic design tool for creating images and things like that. But they have one of those subscription services where there's a free version and then there's like a paid version. And the paid version, of course, is much nicer. So you could have that. Um, or if you're on Hootsuite or some other management tool, you could then pay to upgrade to the pro version. So there's another way to use those extra dollars. Um, and then if you have even a little bit more, you could pay a graphic designer to help you design some of the templates that you use on social media so that things look really nice and sharp. Um, again, you don't need any of those things, but they are nice to have if you have just a little bit of budget. Okay, so plan to plan. This is pretty straightforward. Make sure that your social media team is meeting regularly so that you are all on the same page with what are the campaigns that we are going to be focusing on this month? What's the content? Um, what's happening in your team? Do we need to schedule um, certain types of tweets or posts about it? Um, just make sure that you're meeting regularly. Again, we meet once a month, but that might not work for your team. You can make sure to plan whatever works best for your environment with the amount of people that you have. Um, it could be less formal, more formal. That's really up to you, but do make sure that you get something regular on the books. And then this is my favorite part the content calendar. This was a trick that I learned at the Library Marketing and Communications Conference that happens every year. Um, it's put on by Amigos, and it's in Dallas. It's coming up in November. If you have the budget to send somebody to that, I encourage um, you to go. It was very, very hands-on um, and uh, useful, very useful. But the, the big takeaway I got from that conference was you need to make a content calendar. And it can be very simple. Ours is a Google Sheets. Oh, somebody asked what the conference was. Library Marketing and Communications Conference. Um, so make sure you make a content calendar. It could be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be a Google Sheet. Um, but whatever it is, you need to make sure that you're documenting your content and planning it. And I'll show you on the next slide an example of what that looks like. But it does a few things. You can use it to schedule posts ahead of time, which is a huge time saver in the long run. Um, it also helps you spread the content apart. So if you are scheduling three related posts, you want to make sure they're not like, you know, the, the same day or within a couple of days of each other. If, if you want to kind of spread it out over three weeks, let's say. So your content calendar helps you visually see when everything is scheduled. Um, it can also help you plan out the more static, uh, regular type posts. And then when you go in for your daily check-in of your social media sites, then you can spice it up with little memes or uh, fun stuff that you might find that day, something a little more timely and current. Um, so I definitely encourage you to make a content calendar and to make sure that that content calendar is accessible to every person on your team. Um, and that can, again, look very different depending on where you are and the technology you have available. We use Google Sheets, and we just share it amongst ourselves. You could also just put it in an Excel spreadsheet and put that on a shared drive somewhere. Um, or, I mean, and, and if you want to go low tech, it could literally be a piece of paper on a shared space somewhere in your library. That's up to you. But make sure that your content calendar is shared with everyone on your team. Um, a word about your content that you are planning. So I mentioned that you want to sort of spice up your regular, um, oh, you know, like your events and your, your kind of regular things with more fun, timely stuff. 
my, my word of caution is to make sure that as you're doing that, like you see something awesome and you want to retweet it and you want to share it, make sure that you have an idea in your head of what your social media voice is for your library because what you, you don't want to do is um, kind of go off the rails and if you typically have more of a straightforward sort of professional tone that you are all of a sudden throwing in weird, um, funny, but a little bit off the wall or maybe a little bit uh, naughty memes, um, that's not a good idea typically. So you really want to make sure that you understand the voice that you're trying to convey for your library and to choose fun and timely content that stays within that voice so that everything seems cohesive um, and that everybody on your social media team understands sort of what that voice is so that they don't, uh, again, go off the rails and do something um, a little more risque. Uh, and maybe that's what your library is into and maybe that's what they encourage and that's fine, but for an organization like us, we're a state agency, uh, we have to be a little more conservative about what we put out there. Um, the other tip I would say about writing the actual um, posts was is to focus on the content rather than the event details. In other words, lead with the punchline. So this is not a press release. Um, this is how this is different than a regular marketing job. Um, I'm not just telling everybody about events coming up. I'm trying to make them stop and read. And by, by giving them the punchline first, it gives them a moment to say, wait a minute, I might want to do that. So for example, um, here's, here's two different tweets that I'd composed, and one of them is more marketing and one's more um, content-based. So the first example is, our next webinar is October 23rd. Okay, great. So we have a webinar, it's October 23rd. Um, not many people are going to stop on that. But a different way to put it, hey, library services for seniors and those with memory loss, watch our free webinar on October 23rd. I put the content, the part that's going to grab people, um, at the beginning, because as they're scrolling through their feed, that's what they're going to see first. So lead with the punchline. So here's an example of what our uh, shared social media calendar looks like. Um, and you can see it's very basic. We just have a row for if it's been scheduled or whether it's been done, the date, um, th the channels that it's going out on. CVL is our uh, blog. Facebook, Twitter, LibNet is a an email uh, mailing list we have, and then the actual post content, and then there's some other columns about, like, do we need to include a link or an image or that kind of thing. But as you can see, it is literally a spreadsheet, and that's, you know, it's, it's as easy as that. So I encourage you to explore the tools that you have available and see what's going to work for your library. Okay, so feed and water your social media channels regularly. So this is about creating your workflow. All right. Um, social media does not have to be time intensive, but it does need to be consistent. So when I took over our Facebook page, we were at about 540 likes, and that was in November of 2016. About six months later, we were up to 600 likes, and really, you know, we, like I said, I was getting started, I was a learner, everybody on the team was learning, it wasn't like we were creating these, you know, amazing uh, posts with all the clickbait and all that stuff. We were, the only thing we were trying to do was make sure we were posting at least one thing every day. That's it. So we just tried to post one thing, whether it was scheduled or whether it was sort of in the moment. We tried to get something out every single day of the week. And just by doing that, just by showing our audience that we were there and we were waving at them and saying, hello, the State Library is here. Um, all of a sudden, we went up from 540 to 600 likes. And I think now we're up to about 650. Um, so it is, it, it, it really just is about being consistent. And I don't think there's a magic number with how many posts. Honestly, you can look at your, you can look at your um, analytics and see you know, what's working for you. But um, it's really better that you be consistent than it is that you, that, that you create like 10 amazing posts per day. And my tip on that is to make sure you're using a scheduling tool. Um, you can use TweetDeck, you can use Hootsuite. There's all these fun, crazy, you know, internet type names out there. But find yourself a good scheduling tool. I tend to go back and forth between TweetDeck and then just whatever's internal to Facebook. They have like their own internal um, scheduling component. 
Um, I get in there once a week. I schedule a bunch of stuff out so I don't have to worry about that. And then every day I just drop in for five or 10 or 15 minutes to see what's happening, respond, like, comment, do sort of that regular maintenance, and then that's it. So that could be, if all you have is an hour for scheduling posts, and 10 minutes a day for checking in on your accounts, that could be your social media time for the week, plus your meetings with your team um, monthly. So it really is not, it doesn't have to be super time intensive. Now, can you get in there and just lose yourself? Of course. But if all you have is just a little bit of time every day, you can get it done. And then finally, and this is what I need to get better at, frankly, um, analytics. So you need to refine what's working and what is not. Um, each of these platforms has their own internal analytics. Um, they're, they're great, you know, they help you see how many views, how many engagements, how many likes, all, all that stuff. So um, when you're meeting with your social media team, I encourage you to sit down also with them and show them, okay, here's our month of October and here's, here are our numbers, here's how it compared to last month's numbers. What do you think accounted for this? What kinds of posts were getting good feedback? Can we do more of that in the future? And really, I feel like that's just, that's, that's a pretty easy thing that most of us can do, even if we're not um, super library, you know, data geeks. Um, but you can, of course, go down a rabbit hole and get really crazy with it. Um, kind of just depends on what your team's into. Okay, so that was the basic social media plan. Can you get more complex? Yes, you can. Um, do you need to? Not, not at the beginning, I really don't think you do. So let's pause for a second and talk now about social media graphics, why they matter, and how you can create better ones. So your social media um, uh, presence is going to be primarily image driven. Um, it's not to say that you don't have text content, but what's going to stop people as they're scrolling through their feeds are very compelling images. So you need to figure out how to make yours better or more compelling. Um, if you're DIYing your social media, you're probably DIYing your graphics too. And sometimes homegrown designs can look a little homegrown. Um, I've been guilty of it myself. Um, but when I started creating a little bit better graphics, I noticed we started getting better clicks. Um, so. We're going to talk about some very, very basic, high-level graphic design things that you can put into place today, no matter what tool you're using. It could be Adobe Photoshop, which I don't know how to use. I never learned it, but I recommend Canva or PictoChart um, or anything that's – somebody's already paid those graphic designers to design templates for them. You should just leverage that. Like, you don't have to go to graphic design school. Just use what somebody else already does well. So. When you're creating your graphics or using templates, um, here are some very basic high-level things to keep in mind. Visual, hierarchy, and white space. Okay, as librarians, I think we tend to think that all the white space is like precious and we need to fill it up as much as possible to make maximum use. And that just creates visual clutter. So visual hierarchy just means that you need to make the most important things the easiest to see and to be ruthless about decluttering. And white space is a complement to that. White space helps the eye move through the design and know where to look next. So if you can eliminate unnecessary clutter out of your designs and make the most important things the biggest, you are on your way to good visual hierarchy. So again, we're gonna move through these pretty quickly, but understand that in this case, less is usually more, and the mistake that many of us make is we try to fill up every single inch of that space or every pixel with something, and that's actually uh, going at cross purposes with what you want. Second is get the word art and clip art out of there. If it came from Microsoft Word in the 90s, it does not need to be in your designs anymore. Um, get them out. Um, just use regular fonts. I mean, there's some fun fonts out there. That's great. But just get them out of there. Um, it makes it look dated. It makes it look like we are kind of stuck back in 1995. Um, and that might be kind of fun if you're doing like a retro theme. But for the most part, get it out of there. Um, use something like an icon instead of a uh, clip art. And I have a resource at the end that um, it's called the Noun Project that has nice 
three icons that look classy um, and not like 90s clip art. Okay, the other part of, of creating better graphics is use um, just a few fonts and colors, two to three of each, uh, you know, two to three of each, uh, whether it's font or color. And here's a great example of a homemade poster um, that I found, uh, gosh, I think I found it through the DPLA. So this is a great example of somebody doing it themselves, and it turned out great. They're using red, they're using yellow, there's a nice neutral background, they've used two fonts, and that's it. You can, your eye knows exactly how to move through this page or through this poster. And, um, you know, even though it's like, it's, these pictures are somebody, you know, cut them out and pasted them on, they, it still looks fabulous. I, I think this is a great example of a homegrown design done well because they didn't overload the page with too many fonts and too many colors. So scale that back, really try to focus on what's important and draw the attention with just a few uh, fonts and colors. Images, oh my gosh, see these pictures here? There's a, there's, a, there's a big difference between the one on the left and the one on the right. The one on the left is something that people try to do when they resize images, where they just take that little handle on the image and they just drag it to whatever size they want and everything looks stretched and weird. Um, my suggestion is to either crop it or to proportionately resize it. And here's a pro tip. Um, when you click shift and then drag the corner of the image, it's going to proportionately resize it. You can also click, there's usually like a lock aspect ratio button. Click that so that you don't get those weird stretched images because that says I uh, am an amateur at uh, resizing my images to whoever sees it. So crop them or resize them. Do not stretch them out. And then finally, templates, your new best friends. These are templates from Canva. I've heard, I've seen some people in the chat get all crazy and fun about Canva. I completely agree. You need to go check it out. They have fantastic templates. Get in there, have fun with templates. Realize that they've paid graphic designers to do this for them, so you don't have to learn how to do it yourself. Um, if something doesn't work exactly, you can sort of use specific elements and then customize the way you want. But start with a template, and it's just going to look so much nicer in the long run. Um, Canva also has templates for the different social media sizes. So there's like a Twitter post, there's a Facebook size post, there's an Instagram post. So make sure you're using your templates, and you're going to start thinking, hey, I, look, I, I think I do pretty good in this. I look like a graphic designer. Um, and your designs will look more professional. So use your templates. Um, this is that slide I was telling you all about. So this will be available on the events, events page. I encourage you to take a look. Um, I have some, some uh, images uh, resources and some design tool resources. And then some, on the left, some more learning and training um, for, your, for your further learning. So I do encourage you to just jump in, start, learn along the way, keep learning, um, and know that you're going to get better as you go along. No one's going to be perfect as, at this the first time out of the gate. Phew, okay. So that's <laughs> where we are. <laughs> I think Fantastic. I did it. Did I that get it is in? A, a lot of information. People have been really busy in chat as well. And I just want to reassure people that chat will be available on that resource page so you can uh, refer back to it. A couple things I just want to note. There were uh, some, some questions and some sharing around scheduling tools. And I thought, this is a perfect example of an article we could write. So I'm going to um, work on collecting some of what was shared in chat. But if anyone wants to write an article about scheduling tools, let me know, and we can publish it within the time frame of the series. I'll also mention there were a couple questions about um, policies around getting photo permissions. And that's another uh, topic that surfaced in our survey that we put out, and a number of libraries have provided examples of policies, both policies for staff as well as policies for the public around social media. So I wanted to let you all know that that is coming. Um, Amy, I'd love to get your thoughts on one question that came up a little bit earlier. You know, knowing that you've been working with especially uh, libraries perhaps that maybe are just getting started with social media, there's a real uh, common occurrence I know that happens where people really have to get 
buy-in in order to either set aside the time to do social media or to even create a social media presence on for their library. Can you talk a little bit about, I, I know that Sharice mentioned she's going to talk about getting buy-in using analytics in the next session, but can you just give us some thoughts on how to be able to explain the value uh, that this presence on social media can bring to your library? Yeah, you know, I think I think Sharice is going to, is going to be able to speak to folks who need to bring numbers to their managers to make it seem like they should go ahead with it. Um, there are certain managers that respond to analytics and that kind of thing, and there are others who respond um, to different type of, of conversations and motivations. Um, luckily, in my situation, because we already had social media sort of up and running, um, I was able to sort of take it and, and go with it. Um, but I keep coming back to th that this is just a modern day expectation. This would be like saying, um, we, we need a website and someone else going, well, why do we need a website? It's just kind of the modern day expectation of how you interact with folks um, in your community. Um, it would be strange if you were to look up some, an organization and find out that they were not on social media at all. It would, it would just not seem, um, yeah, it just, it, it's just a modern day expectation. So um, as far as trying to convince uh, management of something that you weren't already starting, um, I would say start with the analytics, but just start with the, you know, we have a website and this is sort of the extension of where that needs to go. Um, I also heard, um, uh, oh, she's great. She, there's a central library um, manager, Denver, Denver Public Library, Central Library, her name is Rachel Fuel, and she's fantastic. And I remember her saying one time that, you know, um, when, when we want to communicate with our patrons, the, the previous way of doing it was we stood in the library and we yelled out onto the street, hey, everybody on the street, um, look at all the fantastic things we're doing in here. Um, and maybe some of them looked up and maybe some of them walked in. What social media does is makes you go onto the street and talk to people out there to tell the people on the street, hey, the library's over here and it's, we're doing a great job and we'd love to have you come in. So it's really that um, getting out of your building and connecting with people where they already are. People are already in social media, you know, by the, by the millions and billions and just so, so the fact that you're not out there interacting with them seems a little bit odd. So get out onto the streets, get out to where people are and where they're already having conversations so that you can talk with them. Excellent. That's great. And I saw just one comment. Um, is it better to be on uh, to, to better to be on social media and not be good at it, or not on social media at all? And I loved your suggestion of just starting small. You know, one post a day, or maybe it's one post every three days. You know, you can start small, and I think you'll you'll be surprised at, at how good <laughs> how good you I, could be. And I would and I would also add to that if you're there's, I mean, there, there are a couple ways where you can be bad at social media, but it usually involves like lawyers and stuff. So <laughs> if, you, if you have a question about like actual content, I would maybe put a pause on it and talk with somebody first. But um, you can't really be bad at it if you're being genuine about wanting to connect with your patrons. Um, look at the conversations that they're having. How can you help out? How can you jump in? Um, also, look at what other libraries are doing and ask yourself, what's, what's so successful about what they're doing and can I just emulate that? Um, I see some folks from Washington State on, you know, in the webinar today and I'm from Washington originally, so I always sort of pay attention, but Washington, State's libra Washington State Library has a fantastic social media presence and a lot of times I sort of just check out what they're doing and see, gosh, could I, could I emulate that in our library? Um, they must have an amazing team over there. So can I do some of that? And if you're a small library wondering if you should start and wondering how to start, look at what is successful for other libraries and try to emulate it. Are they doing a lot of funny stuff? Are they doing a lot of you know, image-based posts? Like what's working for them? And can you try and emulate it in your own community? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, lots and lots to think about and certainly uh, lots to work on. So I'm going to actually um, 
move us on over to Jessica's presentation. And Jessica's going to dive a little bit more deeply into Facebook, which is a great place to start if you have no face or no uh, social media presence. So thank you so much for being here, Jessica. I'll let you get us uh, move us on. Thank you. I'm really excited to talk about this. A few years ago, I was working at a public library. And our Facebook page, we had a reach of like 30 people. And I was wondering, is that normal? Am I, is this worth my time? Is this something I can really improve? So I did a lot of research, and there's not much out there for libraries. But there are resources for small businesses. And it turns out what works for them works for our libraries, because we also have a small staff. And we have limited time, and we have zero to very small budgets. And so I used some of the tricks that they were talking about, and it made a huge difference in our feed. So from 30, which was our best, we were getting to like 100 reach per post that we were doing. So there is a science behind Facebook, and I'm very excited to talk to you guys today about it. So we're going to talk about three different session objectives. Number one, to understand Facebook's role in social media, the science behind it. Two, we'll discuss the different ways that libraries can utilize Facebook for the best outreach. And then three, I want to help you guys come up with a few resources that you can use to stay on top of it all so that you can reach a lot of your goals without having to do a lot of work. So. There's a huge push for libraries to be on social media, and I think that makes a lot of sense. 86% of the United States population is on the Internet, and 8 out of 10 of those are on Facebook. So if you're looking for one place to be, Facebook's a good starting point for you. The other great thing about Facebook is that they have the most people on daily, as you can see from the second chart. So they're on 15 minutes. So the question is, how are you going to reach this potential audience with the time you have and the resources that you have? So a lot of people think, well, I have a personal account, so I just create a page account for Facebook. I don't know exactly what I need to do. But that can't be further from the truth. Your personal account is very different than your page account. Your personal account marks you as a person. You are following people, your family and friends, other pages, other groups. And when you post something, because you're a top priority, people are going to see it. So it doesn't matter how often you post. A page is different. You can't see other people's accounts. You can't connect with them. And you're, you're just putting information out there and hoping that people will like it. So they're structured very differently. Now, a personal account, like I said, top priority is your friends and family. They also reserve a small portion of these posts for informing posts and entertaining posts. And that's where your library page posts will come in. So you are competing against all the other pages and groups that they're following to try to show up in that small percent. The personal account, um, as you react, they build up your news feed. So what you like, Facebook pays attention to, and they show you more about it. If you have something you don't like, you can easily hide or unfollow yourself. Page account is a lot different. You can post as much as you want, but not all of it gets through. In fact, organic reach is down to 2 to 6% of your followers. The more people who actually like your page, the smaller your organic reach is. So if, you're, if you have 100,000 followers, 2% is more likely. For those of you who have smaller followers, you can be happy about that. That means you have more people are then be seeing your posts in the bigger pages. But because you're trying to get through with all the other pages that are posting, you need to post often. It's really important. And those posts have to do well. If people like your posts, you're going to get better reach. If they don't like your posts, if they don't interact with that at all, then your post is going to get less reach the next time you post on there. So it's really important that you understand what an engaging post is and how to be social on Facebook. One of the best things about a page account is that you have the Facebook Insights, where you can track and measure results and hopefully tweak it to make it work to your advantage.
It's not switching over. Oh, there we go. So the average user gets 1,500 posts a day in their feed on average. So Facebook had to come up with an algorithm to find out what would work best and what people really want to see. And then all the posts that they're not interested in used to fade away. Otherwise, people won't stay on Facebook that long. So we, TechCrunch did find four factors that are very important. And, <clears throat> sorry. And, um, and it's important that you pay attention to those because it will help you with your future posts. So C for the creator. Facebook pays attention to the person who is posting the content. So if there are three of you posting on Facebook, and one person tends to get a lot of great results and another people who get less results, the person who gets the higher reach actually does better when they, re when they do the next post, even though you, if someone else does the same topic. So it makes a big difference. Your post is really important, too. They show it to a small percentage of people. And if they really like it and they're interacting well, they're going to show it to more people throughout that day. And the next time you post, they're going to show more of that post to the people, to, to your followers. And then they found that people kind of like certain types of posts better. So it might be a status, it might be a photo, it might be a video. And so if your post is a video, they're more likely to show it to your followers who like videos or your followers, or if you do an article, then the followers that like articles. So you need to find out what works best for your followers and what most of them like. And then recency is really important. Facebook doesn't want to be old news. So if you post once a week and then your followers only log in once a week and you posted six days ago, they're never going to see any of your posts. Now, these are just four factors that they pulled out um, that we really know about. But Facebook actually looks at 100,000 other factors. So there's a lot of things that go into the algorithm. So it's a lot of work, and, and, but once you get the science to it, it's going to be a whole lot easier. Um, for, for me, there are seven factors that I think that are important that if you follow it, gives you a successful Facebook page. So for us, we found that you know, we could reach 100 organic reach, so that was always our goal. Now, I did tell you that organic reach is down to 2 to 6% of your followers. So if you're not hitting that, but you're within 2 to 6%, you're doing as well as other pages. However, I have found that libraries seem to do better than businesses do. So if you can strive for the 100, you, you will make it more, more worthwhile of your time. Uh, just as Amy has said, consistent posting is really important. At least once a day, um, but if you can do it twice a day, we'll talk about that a little more. But whatever you post, it has to be engaging. It has to be something that people will ever respond to. So make sure your follower interaction is important. Do they like it? Do they share it? Do they comment on it? If someone does a comment on your page, you want to make sure that you respond back to it so that they feel acknowledged and that you are, you're part of the community. They're not just out there. And it encourages them to comment again. Now, Facebook now tells people how fast you respond to messages. So you want to make sure that you're you're kind of on top of it. You can have your Facebook set up that you get an email when someone messages you, so you can hop on and respond. And then your images are also really important. Facebook is, um, is big on both desktop and mobile, so using an image that works, looks good for both of them is really ideal so that you look very professional. And then the easiest thing you can do is your URL. Uh, Facebook gives you facebook.com slash a whole bunch of random numbers. You go into your settings, you can update that, and then you can um, put your library name into it, and so people can easily find you later on. So you can do this. It takes some time, but once you get the science behind it, you can stay on top of it. Jennifer, are you seeing any questions? Um. Not anything right now, no. It's been a little quieter. They're they're listening very closely. <laughs> okay. All right. So then we'll move on to nine ways that you can maximize your reach and try to hit that 100. So number one, you have to post often. Uh, we usually say once in the morning, something serious, 
and then once in the evening something fun. But make sure you post every single day, not just when you're in the office, because, again, only a small percentage of your posts are getting through. So you need to make sure that you're generating a lot so that you are getting through to a lot of your followers. Now, this may seem overwhelming. You definitely don't want to try to sign in every single day and do this on the fly. So like Amy had said, you want, having a content calendar is really important. So carve out some time, sit down, and schedule ahead and plan what you're going to do for the next week or two. And try to plan things that you aren't creating yourself. Find other resources that you can reshare because that's so important if you're going to stay on top of this, and we'll talk more about that later. I also highly recommend um, signing up for Google Alerts. You can do it for your library name. You can do it for the town or city your library is in, and they'll let you know when things are posted about it. So if you have, like, an article published about your library, that's great content that you can use on social media and reshare. Um, you know what's going on around your, your town, your area. You can post about that, too, because everyone who's following you are patrons, and they live in that area, and they're interested in it. So you can use that as well. I also highly recommend If This Then That, which lets you automate your posts and connect your different social media accounts if you want help staying on top of that. So you live and die by clicks. This is so important to understand. So make sure you're only posting engaging content. You don't want to post your press release. You don't want to post something that only interests a small sliver of your patrons, like an ESL class. You're not going to get a lot of responses for a lot of your followers, so Facebook is not the place where you want to put it. You want to make sure whatever you put online, you're going to get a like, an emotion, a comment, a share, clicks to read, watch later. Um, and even, you know, if someone says they love your post, that scores higher than just a general like. So all of this really matters to your current post and how many people are going to see it. And then the next time you post, it matters how many people Facebook's going to show it to. Now, a lot of people don't like to hear just about one person talking about themselves, and libraries are the same thing. We fall in that. We can't just talk about ourselves. We need to share content on our shared values. So what do libraries share with their patrons? A love for reading, information about authors, book humor, things going on in our community. These are things you can tap into and post on that on your page and help you reach your goal of, reach, of posting two things a day. Uh, in my library, articles on reading was really big. Information on authors, especially their new books, um, pictures with book humor, those things have done really well and helped boost up our, our reach that we've had. So what do we mean by an engaging post? Sometimes you just have to be creative with how you get the information out there. So in one example, the first one, there was only one like for the story time. The second picture that came out a few days later had 22 likes. And there's a big difference between the two. The first one is like an ad, and it has a generic picture. And really the only people who are likely to respond to this are caregivers who have a kid between the age 3 to 6 who is available on that Wednesday to come to this particular program. So it didn't do very well. The second one also talks about a program, but the picture has this cute, adorable dog watching a kid trying to learn how to read. Suddenly, people who had no reason to respond to a story time now had a reason to. And so a lot of people love the post, and they like the post, and it did really well. So make sure that you're posting the right kind of pictures, and you're framing it in a way that will make people want to respond. And if you can't find a way to do it, it just doesn't belong on Facebook. Now, a lot of people don't want to post fluff on their Facebook pages. It needs to be only about the library. It needs to be just about us. But you're hurting yourself in so many different ways. You need to post the fun things because Facebook is a social media network. You need to be social on it. And these fun things are the reason why people click and why people respond. So you want to use that to help increase your reach. So when you do have to post something that's important, say you're closed on a snow day, more people are going to see it because you already kept your reach up really high. So this can mean you can post pictures that encourage people to comment on it, sharing about their reading. If you have a mascot, you can do it in fun, interesting ways so people have a chance to laugh and respond to it. 
A lot of people love pictures of kids and reading quotes, so you can use those to your advantage. Uh, you can also talk about bookworms and reading problems and funny things. There's a lot of stuff out there that you can reuse and post, and it always gets a, lot, a great response from readers. Another thing you can do is talk about the history of your town or city and post pictures up on it. And if you can tag another page like the Historical Society, you can automatically double your reach because the Historical Society and your followers get to see this. Another great thing about that particular post is that um, you have a lot of pictures. So the people have to click through pictures, which means they're interacting with your posts. So if you do a bunch of pictures and, um, and put it in one post, you're actually helping yourself because you're encouraging people to react to it even if they don't like it after they click through the pictures. And then lastly, the holidays. You know, try to do it in a fun way. People do a lot of creative things with books to celebrate the holidays, and you can make your own or you can share someone else's. But a lot of patrons love that, and they will respond to it positively. And again, that keeps your reach up and, um, and keeps you going. So don't kiss and tell. Don't treat Facebook like a library bulletin board. Only post the things on there that are social, that you know or you hope at least will get an interaction. Um, that could work for the general, the, the largest group that you have posted on there. And if you can do that, if you keep that frame of mind, you're going to see an increase in your reach and you're going to see it consistently stay up. Now, when we're talking about engaging posts, we talked about posting about your programs. I don't recommend actually doing a post about a program. What you really want to use is your Facebook event, and you want to make that. So it, Facebook treats it a lot different, and they did a great job making changes to it to make it really relevant. So focus on your big events. Don't do your weekly ones because it can get overwhelming if people see too many events. But then what people can do is they can mark that they're interested in it. And then it will show up on their Facebook calendar. And then when it gets close to the date, Facebook will send them a reminder. And you don't even have to do it. I, was, I know for my friends, whenever they like a children's event, I see it in my news feed. So it reaches me too. And then I can mark on if I'm interested or not. So it's a great, great powerful tool that you can use about an event. It doesn't mean you can't post later. Um, you can show a picture of how it went, but, um, but if you really want to get the word out, Facebook events is the place you want to be. The one problem I heard about this is that Facebook allows people to mark if they're going or not, and sometimes patrons have a hard time understanding that they, um, that they haven't actually registered for the program. They have to go to your library's website and do that. So it might take a little bit of growing pains to kind of get through that. Just pay attention to who's saying they're going and if they signed up already. And you can also put messages on the event saying that you need to um, make sure you register at the library to actually count for the registration numbers. But it's a powerful tool, and I highly recommend using it that way. Uh, for your weekly programs, though, what I would do is do a general post and have a really awesome picture, something that pulls out the heartstrings, and just kind of casually mention, oh, this is a weekly program. Feel free to come and join us but you don't want to do every single program that your library offers or you, people will stop following you. So one of the best things you can do, especially for the person who doesn't have a lot of free time, is resharing content. And this actually works to your benefit in so many different ways. Because if you share something on Facebook that got a really high reach, you're, you're going to get an automatic Facebook bump and get a higher reach than you normally get. Because this post is proven quality content. People like this. People are, are interacting with it. They don't feel like it's spam. And so Facebook loves that. You're doing that. So you need to work on a page feed, get um, posts from other libraries, and then you can reshare those and fill up all of your calendar without having to take the time out to create every little thing that you post. So we mentioned a page feed a few times. Basically what you do is you visit a page, and then you click on the down arrow on like, and you can like it as your page. Then when you go to your home page, to your library's page, underneath how many people are following you is your page feed, which I marked with that yellow arrow pointing to it. 
So when you click on that, that brings you to the second image, which shows you all the pages that you like, and it shows you their news feed and, and what they're posting about. Now, I noticed in the other presentation, a lot of you guys are saying, let's follow each other's libraries. You will, will want to do it this way and follow them as your page and not as a person, because if you are following them as a person and you don't respond to their posts, then you're hurting them because then, then their percentage is going down of how many people like their post. But you can't like a post, someone like or comment on a post as your page. So it's okay to do it through the page feature and you're not going to hurt their numbers. So I highly recommend doing it that way. Now, in your Facebook Insights, you also have an option of pages to watch. And so you, the ones that you see are doing really well and keep doing content that you really want to share, you want to put them into this category. And then when you click on their name on the, um, the hyperlink, you will, um, it will bring you to the image on the right, and you can see what the best their top posts are for that week. So it's really easy for you to get quality content really fast. Now, I underlined the timestamp, which is underneath their name. That will give you a URL that you can use to share, to, to schedule a share later. So if you click on the share bottom down, it will share all automatically. So that's not going to help you if you're trying to plan out for the week. But that timestamp is super important. Now, I started a shareable click Facebook group. If you're doing a lot of social media posts, this might be some place you want to be. We have over 2,000 people who are in this group, 2,000 libraries, and basically we all share our top performing posts. If they're generic, you're welcome to share it on your own page. If it's specific to that particular library, it might be a good learning opportunity. Like I know one library had posted about this kid left behind a stuffed animal, and they did a cute, did you, you know, can you help us find the owner sort of thing, and it went viral for them. So if you happen to get that later, now you know what to do, and you can use that, that strategy for your own page. Now, here on the Facebook group, you don't want to click the timestamp because if you do and you share that post, you're going to get the librarian posting about how wonderful this post had done. You don't really want to show that part. So it's really important that you click on the word post, which you'll see at the end. Yes, right there. And, um, and that will bring you to the original post where you see, you know, we couldn't resist, pumpkin, spice, everything. And that's something you do want to share on your own page. So that's what you want to do. The other great thing about the shareable click is just, it's good for crowdsourcing ideas. If you don't know what to do for an upcoming holiday, you can ask to see what other people have planned, and then you can either get inspired from it or maybe even share back and forth for things that you can use. So we talked about a lot of what you can do on your page and hoping that it gets through to people. Um, but there are things you can do to reach out as well. Uh, you can't do it as your page, but as your personal account, you can join Facebook groups for your local schools in your town or city. And I highly recommend doing that. A lot of people are on Facebook, as we started from the beginning, from the Pew Center Research. And it, you get to learn what's going on around you. And then you can use it to your advantage. So like in our city, if you, we have um, Business Mondays. So on Mondays, you can post about library programs and things going on, and that would be totally okay. And you get to know what's going around the town, too. Uh, schools are a great way for reaching parents. Uh, I was a teen librarian, and we had a writing competition, and we tripled how many people participated because we advertised in the local schools' Facebook groups. And it was just a great way for us to reach parents to then encourage their teens to participate. So you can use that to your advantage. Don't do it too often. But, you know, you can talk about summer reading. You can talk about your big programs during all of the breaks during the year. And, um, and it would be a good way to reach people who don't normally come to the library. Another thing you can do is if you get a lot of likes on your page, you can actually click on the, the, the name and the number of likes on the particular post, and it brings you to this picture that I pulled up right here. And you get to see how many of those people are actually following your page. So you can invite them to actually like your page. So it might be one way for you to increase followers on people who actually like your content, but they haven't taken that extra step themselves to go and like it. 
Now, if they already like your page, you'll notice it's grayed and it says liked and grayed out. So you can't you can't invite them. So that's one way to know it. You might find some people are listed as an invite and like, wow, they liked all my posts. I'm pretty sure they're following me, and they probably are. But Facebook has privacy settings, and so if, they're, if they have it locked down, it won't tell you that. But Facebook only lets you invite them once, so you don't have to worry about spamming, spamming anyone. Now, this technique only works for the pages that have up to 100,000 followers. So if you're beyond that, you can't do that. And it only works with posts that have a lot of likes. So if only one or two people like it, it, it won't give you that option. But if it groups them all together, then you can click on that link and have that option. So I heard a lot of libraries found this very useful and has worked for them. Now, I know we don't want to spend money advertising, but I have heard great things about advertising on Facebook. And so if you want to give it a shot, it might be worth your time. It's not that expensive. And you can also limit to particular age group, a particular location, um, even a gender if you have a, a particular program that you're doing. So you can really reach your target group fast a lot better than posting in a lot of other places. And then, let's say you boost a post, you can go to that post that got a lot of likes and then do what we just said for number two, and you can invite those non-fans to actually follow up and like your page. So you can use that to your advantage. Jessica, can I just ask a really quick question? Someone asked if that invite to request, or the, the request um, to invite, does that show up as your page or as you as an individual? The invite. It shows up as your page. Okay, excellent. So that's the good news. And it comes and it pops up as a notification. So they'll get a notification next time they log in that this page had asked them if they, to like them. However, there is, I believe, if you're friends with that person, it will default to you. But okay. if you're not friends with that person, then it would be your page. Okay. Good question. So a few months ago, Facebook allows you to connect your groups to a particular page. So this is kind of awesome. Groups is something I think libraries should look into and really consider. They get a higher priority on the news feed than a page does. Um, notifications will appear sometimes from the group, so they'll get periodic notifications about things you're posting. It will give you a chance to really divide up your audience. So if you want to do a children's group, a teen group, an adult group, or maybe, excuse me, or maybe you want to do one that's focused on a particular um, program, like a book group or whatever, then you can just share things from your page that is specific to them that you think they would really like to see. You wouldn't have to post every single day because groups don't need that to, to be relevant in people's news feed. And uh, you can comment and like as your page. So if people don't know who you are, they don't have to wonder, why is just responding to everything? You know, you can respond as your page and look really professional. And the other newest thing that they add is that admins can now create and schedule posts ahead of time. So you don't have to do the group page whenever you want to post. You can get that done earlier. Uh, and this might be the wave of the future. I am hearing that Facebook is decreasing organic reach, and they, um, they're they actually doing an experiment now where all Facebook pages are going to be in a different news feed, and only those who are paid are going to be in the general news feed. So this might be something that libraries would want to consider if they do end up going that road so that you can still be active on Facebook without having to pay money every time you want to reach people. Words really matter on Facebook. Their algorithm pays attention to it. So you want to make sure you will avoid specific words like buy, sale, click, win, um, all those get marked as spammy, advertisements, Facebook doesn't want to do that. So if you're posting about your book sale, you want to make sure you're very creative in how you word that so you don't automatically get a decrease in your reach. However, Facebook highlights your milestones. So you can talk about work anniversaries, you can talk about author birthdays, you can hit retirement, and using those particular words will give you an automatic boost. So I know in December we're going to be talking about um, looking at your statistics and analytics in the webinar, and I highly recommend that you guys all sign up for that. But it is important for increasing your, your outreach, so I want to make sure that we talked a little bit about it today. So the number one thing you need to do is just try a variety of content. You know, you said one of the big factors is the post type that you're using. 
So you need to find out what is the majority of your followers actually liking, and then those are the ones that you try to get into your newsfeed a lot. Um, and then times of day make a big difference. You know, it could be that the mornings do better for you than night. So then you need to kind of plan and decide how you want to, to do your posts. And then the length of the post and the character count, video time, those all make a difference whether or not people pause and read what you're posting or they ignore it and keep on going through. So you need to really spend a month or two trying a bunch of different things and see what actually works and then using that to your advantage later. Now, your Facebook insights could be helpful. They like to tell you how many people, how many of your followers are on per day and what time of the day they tend to be on. I have never found it helpful. For me, this is what my pages look like. It's basically the same number of people are on every single day. And from 9 a.m. until 9 p.m., it's the same number of people on. So trying to experiment and see what works for you really helps. I can tell you a lot of people say 1 to 3 p.m. is the most popular time people are on Facebook. However, if you post during that time, you have a higher amount of competition against all the other pages. So you may not get through the competition if you post during that. If you post early in the morning, right before people wake up, you might hit all the people who hop online and want to quickly look through Facebook before they start their day. So you really need to experiment and see what works for you. Um, the one that does work really well for me is that they give you the statistics on your posts, and they tell you how well it's done. Your reach, they tell you the day, so you can see Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, the time, the type of post, and that is where you're going to find what is working. And sometimes you have a great post, but you posted it at the wrong time of day. So don't worry when you're experimenting about reusing these posts and seeing, okay, would it make a difference if I do it at this time? And then paying attention to what the numbers are. And then because you're only getting out, getting a small percentage of your posts out, you can also go back here for finding, okay, can I reuse any of this content a month later or two months later? Because you're going to reach different people each time you post it. So don't be worried about being fearful of doing that as well. So do you have any other questions, Jennifer? Wow, there's been a lot going on. I, I just posted a link to the Libraries and Social Media Facebook group because I know that a lot of the questions that have come up today do um, show up and, and are on that group um, for sure. But there was just a quick question about hashtags on Facebook. Do they work similarly to Twitter? And um, have, you, have you found success using hashtags on Facebook? I don't think it's really catched on Facebook. Um, you can, and I know some people have said it has worked well for them, and some people said that it hasn't. I guess it depends on how savvy your crowd is, and if they know to click on the hashtag, that it would help them a lot. Yeah, I so will you can say try that, it. Yeah, yeah, I will say that a number, that there was an earlier post to chat about using each day of the week for sort of different types of content. And I know a mm -hmm. lot of libraries use hashtags for Tuesday's Trivia, Trivia Tuesday, or um, things like that. And I know there are some sort of general uh, hashtags that maybe, you know, that would show up in, in general hashtag feeds that unless you have them specific to your library, those are going to show up in the broader um, hashtag world on Facebook. But I do know some libraries are using um, really, like one of the libraries in the social library that I posted today has a um, Lego club, and they have a specific hashtag to their library's Lego club. So, you know, thinking about either making those hashtags specific to your library and using it as a way for your community then to quickly, you know, leverage the opportunity to have that feed from that hashtag show up. So, so that's one one way. Um, and there were, as somebody said, this is a huge amount of information, and I'm now really glad that we've put a month, <laughs> at least a month between each of our webinars. Um, I really encourage people to uh, take a look at the learner guide or any of the other tools as a way to sort of dive deeper between sessions. Uh, pick a few, a handful of steps that maybe uh, will move you forward. I. We had a we actually had some activities in the session that we didn't have time for 
in terms of prioritizing, I'm going to actually just jump ahead here. Yeah. Um, there was one activity uh, we had here of selecting some of these uh, ways to use social media that many of the folks who responded in the survey would like to explore more. So, for instance, levering hashtags. Um, so, think about the things that maybe you could focus on between sessions as a way to take some baby steps. Some of you have some more advanced questions, and I encourage you to tap into the group on Facebook as a way to connect. And um, certainly make sure you're registered for the uh, remaining two webinars. And the, the next session will focus actually on analytics. And I know lots of questions that came up today relate to analytics and the ways to leverage analytics to both get your administration's buy-in, to be able to demonstrate how you're uh, spreading the word, the different ways in which you're using Facebook. As I said, we continue to collect your uh, input on the social media and library survey, which we hope will be a valuable tool for you all to bring uh, your story and your needs to your uh, community. So again, that's another great way, and I'll put the link to the page that will launch you to the survey in there as well. Um, both sessions will be available uh, as a part of this recording, and also, uh, or sorry, both presenters' <laughs> content will be available as part of the recording. I will let you all know later today once that's all posted, and also um, we'll send you all a certificate for joining today's session within a week, so keep your eyes out for that. And again, any of our webinars are all always recorded and made available to your fellow learners who maybe weren't able to join with us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time on November 30th. I'll also mention that as you leave today, I'll send you to a short survey. That survey will help us guide our ongoing series and programming and also provide feedback to our presenters and again, thank you so much to our presenters, Jessica and Amy, for being here today and bringing all your great work to this series. And a special thanks to Molly, who will be joining us next time as a presenter. And thank you again to TechSoup for joining us on this series. And we look forward to seeing what you all bring to your social media presence and the great work your libraries are doing. Thank you all very much, and thanks again to our captioner as well. Everyone have an excellent rest of your week.